Yes, Mr. Green. My Lord, in an attempt to be helpful, <coughs> my junior has um, found uh, an extract from Lewin on trusts, the extract concerning reputation and decision, and he has sent that through electronically. My Lord, I'm afraid in the time available, I have not been able to look at the relevant passages in it. Um, save to note, I think that they are at 5 079 to 5 085. And that's new, is it? You've just sent it through? Well, yes, within the last few moments. Right, OK. But I'm afraid I'm not in a position to address your lordship's I've got the speaking note. I haven't got Lewin. OK, well, anyway, you carry on with your submissions and we'll get to it. Oh, well, yes. Uh, I was uh, taking your lordship through uh, FSHC and what was found in that case intention of the party. Uh, and it is notable that um, it was the absence of discussion about the particular objectionable obligation uh, that was seized on by um, the respondent in the court as a reason why rectification should be granted. Uh, <coughs> I'm taking your lordship to 182. <coughs> At 184, one can see that uh, counsel for the appellant sought to make um, capital out of the fact that there was no communication uh, to the effect that, or expressly said that, the documents were intended to do no more than what the parties had discussed. And then at 191 and 192, at 191, the third compelling, compelling factor. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but don't we need to pause on 189, which starts when against that background, which was Mr. Wolfson's submission that this wasn't a fresh transaction, that was a missing brick. Yes. And then what's said at 189, uh, if one goes down to the bottom, based on this, of course, the exchange between the solicitors, clearly implicit in that explanation that, as Mr. Brandwaite and Mr. Candler both understood from what was said, they're the solicitors, the stated purpose was the only purpose of executing the deeds, and that there was no intention that the deeds should, in addition, commit the parent to new and onerous obligations which it was not contractually required to undertake. So that's something that was understood as a result of the discussions. Yes, the, the deed had one purpose only, which and was to um, put in place the missing brick, as it were. And uh, should not have the new and onerous obligations. Well, my Lord, it's expressed in, the, in, in that uh, formula, there was no intention that the deeds should, in uh, addition, commit the parent to new and onerous obligations. All right. So there was an absence of intention, or at least that's how it could be well, read. Well, th that's the problem with the argument, is that there is a big difference, as my Lord pointed out before lunch, between agreeing uh, that there should not be something and not agreeing that there should be anything. Uh, well, with respect, of course, yes, there is a difference between the two. But for the purposes of rectification, in my submission, it's not necessary to go as far as to show that there was express agreement that there should be nothing else in the contract for what there already is. But there has to be express agreement that there should not be a declaration of trust of this kind, which there is not in this case. That wasn't what they found. Well, in my submission, what was found was that the son was to assist the father. Uh, they agreed nothing as to the declaration of trust. Well, absolutely. There was no intention at all that the, that the son should benefit in any way from this transaction. The intention throughout was that the father should obtain whatever benefit accrued from the transaction. Well, the judge rejected that. Mr. Justice Morris rejected that as as a proper interpretation of, of the trial judge's finding, that there was an intention, a positive intention yes. on both sides of sole, yes, he, of sole he, beneficial His interpretation was that that was not a positive finding made by the trial judge. Yes. Um, it, You're on a slightly separate point, which is that he was right in his alternative ground. Well, ab that, absolutely. Which was essentially that they only agreed A. Yes. The, the document contains A and B. All I'm doing by deleting B is making it reflect 
the extent to which they reached agreement. Well, yes, that is the purpose of rectification. It's a discretionary remedy, and he uh, exercised his discretion in this case on that basis. And the difficulty I have with that argument, speaking entirely for myself, is the conflation I was talking about. Um, if one had, for example, uh, a, a series of contractual documents with a lot of boilerplate terms in, as is common in commercial contracts, and they include, for example, an entire agreement clause, uh, it may very well be that the parties never discuss an entire agreement clause at all. If you said to them, did you intend to have an entire agreement clause, they would both unhesitatingly say, I have no idea what an entire agreement clause is. No, I never had that intention. But the fact that neither of them had an intention for it to be included, would not would it be a reason for rectifying it to delete it? Well, in my submission, it may. Uh, neither party in that case would suffer any prejudice, um, simply because there were quite a few clauses, uh, one would assume. There'd be no reason for a party to seek to rectify an agreement that contain standard boilerplate clauses. Well, it might but, very well be, because, well, well, because knows, my, when disputes arise, well, <laughs> such a clause might be very unwelcome. But, but I, I, I do appreciate that, but um, why should it not be the case that if the parties agree that a contract should contain X, and it contains X and Y, why shouldn't rectification not at least be an option, a discretionary remedy available, um, to remove Y that was never intended to be there by the parties? Well, I think the answer might be that you start with contracts, and you treat them as valid and complete, and you have to have a reason for, it, for deleting something. Yes. And you don't delete something simply because you can't show that it was positively discussed and agreed. To answer that point, in my submission, one can see from the findings in this case that there was agreement that the, the transaction should be limited in scope. And that it would extend to conferring on the sum any, in broad terms, any benefit. And well, that's why I, I took the Lordships earlier to um, the findings uh, in the judgment uh, in Mr. Uh, of His Honour Judge Monty at 3 and 34 to 37, which in my submission do indicate. a common understanding that the son's role was limited to assisting the father to obtain the mortgage and the property. And that was the extent of his involvement in the matter. At paragraph 35, Sonny Judge Monty goes on to explain why it would be both improbable, um, or why it would be improbable, um, that the father would have made his son uh, an immediate uh, gift of half the property to the exclusion of any interest which his siblings or their mother might otherwise have had. Well, can I just read you Lewin, paragraph 5079? The conditions which must be satisfied in order for the court to order rectification of a voluntary settlement are as follows, um, and then there must be convincing proof to counteract the evidence of a different intention represented by the document itself. There must be a flaw, that is, an operative mistake in the document, such that it doesn't give effect to the settlor's intention. The specific intention of the settlor must be shown. It is not sufficient to show that the settlor did not intend what was recorded. It must also be shown what he did intend. And there must be an issue capable of being contested between the parties affected by the mistake, notwithstanding that all relevant parties consent. Um, there is, I'm afraid, no footnote to that. Well, I think that may have been Mr. Justice Farley, um, from what I read over lunch. Oh, right, OK. Well, there we are. So that supports my Lord's point to you, doesn't it? Right. Well, yes, and I, I seek to meet it by referring to the findings made by the judge. Yes. Uh, in my submission, it's, it's perfectly clear um, from paragraph three that the son's involvement was as a result of a request for help from his father. And from the findings at, uh, in particular, paragraph 34, 35, and 37, that the son's uh, involvement was purely, uh, 
and that word is, in my submission is important, purely to assist with the purchase that the mortgage advance could be obtained. And that was to be the extent of his involvement. Uh, and so uh, where the form TR1 includes a declaration of trust conferring a harsh share on the sum, that is contrary to what the parties had intended at the outset. His Honourable Judge Monty was well aware of the uh, need to uh, show or have convincing proof. He refers to that at paragraph 26 <coughs> of his judgment. And my Lord, paragraphs 26 and 27 make perfectly clear that he's concerned with rectification and not decision. Uh, and he goes on at paragraph 37 to say, in my judgment, David has satisfied me on the on the facts, on the balance of probability, <coughs> the necessary convincing standard that the TR1 was completed by mistake. The declaration of TR1 can't stand. It must follow from my factual findings that Dean, the son, has no beneficial interest in the property. That was a consequence of the factual finding made by the judge. Okay, I'll say in my judgment, the property is held beneficially for David alone. My Lord, when one looks at those paragraphs together, 3, 34 to 37, in my submission, uh, one can see that the judge was making a positive finding uh, that uh, the son was uh, simply assisting the father to get the mortgage and uh, the property, but the beneficial interest was to be the father's alone. And the declaration of trust was simply inconsistent. Well, I, I understand your reliance on the finding in the second sentence Dean became a joint owner purely to assist with the purchase but given that there were no discussions about what the about how the property should be held you can only really make good this submission can't you if it necessarily follows that a person who only assists with the purchase for the purposes of the mortgage necessarily is intended to have no beneficial interest. And that, that doesn't follow. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. There may be circumstances in which they are. Well, in my submission, it, it does flow from the judge's finding that the intention, that the common intention was that there should be no sharing of the equity and risk of the property. That, and that must mean that there is a father alone who is to have it. That's a finding made repeatedly in paragraph 34. That, that, I'm sorry, that, that you say is the effect of the, of the first and the last sentence. No intention on either side, there would be co-ownership in equity. Yes. And that follows, obviously, from uh, the first, uh, second sentence, I should say, where Dean's involvement is to assist his father. And looking at the background, that the son wasn't living at the family home at the time, he was living with his grandmother. He was earning, he was able to assist simply by putting his name on mortgage applications, simply by putting his name on the uh, transfer of property, and that was it. And where do you say there's the finding that those intentions were communicated, or there was an outward expression of accord of those intentions? My Lord, it, it's perfectly clear that His Honour Judge Monty does not, in, in terms, refer to there, be, uh, there being an express. Um, an expression of uh, accord in that way, but uh, again, given that this was, as he says in paragraph three, a response to a request for help from his father, uh, and at paragraph 34, that this was purely to assist um, the purchase of the property, in my submission, one can infer a common understanding. The feature of this case that it was fought, as I've said before, on an all or nothing basis. And so when the judge says that um, it follows from the factual findings that he has no beneficial interest, um, the judge is not considering the possibility that he has some beneficial interest but not an equal interest. Well, I, I would 
submit that the judge has found that the intention was that the father should hold the entirety of the interest, and that was the end of the matter. So when he says it's wholly improbable that the son would have half the property to exclude any interest which the siblings or mother might otherwise have, what does that add to it? The mother and the siblings don't seem to have any interest in this property. To my knowledge, they don't, not as a result of the transaction, but the father was standing not in place of them, but he was the breadwinner, the provider. I'm able to understand why, for example, this young man should be in no better position than his siblings, but I'm just wondering why he should be in a worse position. Well, my knowledge, he's not. The simple fact is, as a result of the order made below, the father has the entirety of the... Well, I understand that, but that's because of the last sentence, the second last sentence, that even what the father thought wasn't the answer. My lord, no. This is a case that had a difficult history, my lord, and the parties didn't perhaps devote themselves to the details of the interest necessarily that they were claiming and the evidence to support their... The reality is that what was taking place here was the creation of a family home for the benefit of everybody involved. Well, yes, although the son was not living with his parents at the time. He was living with his grandmother and didn't actually move to the family home until 2003, three years after this transaction took place. So the purpose was not to provide him with a home, it was to provide his parents and his siblings with a home. My lord, I believe I've covered all the grounds, or rather all the points I was going to make in relation to the principal ground of challenge, ground four. Your lord, you can see that I take the other grounds fairly briefly. Ground three assumes that the courts dealt with this on the basis of rescission in my submission. They did not, so ground three doesn't arise. Ground five attacks the exercise of discretion by Mr. Justice Morris, but in my submission the appellant has not identified any error of law or approach in the manner in which Mr. Justice Morris exercised his discretion. And so in my submission, for the reasons Mr. Justice Morris gave, he was entitled to exercise his discretion by rectification, deleting the declaration of trust. And that leaves, my lord, ground six. The declaration of trust having been deleted, on what terms or how was the equitable interest to be held, that was determined on the basis of a common intention of constructive trust. In my submission, again, Mr. Justice Morris went through the various factors that he was entitled to consider. He considered the appellant's arguments, the factors relied on by the appellant, and found nonetheless that the trust that arose benefited the father only. And he was entitled to come to that conclusion. No error has been shown in relation to that. I should just touch, I suppose, on the floodgates argument. My lord, if this was a case appropriate for rectification, the fact that it may have consequences for other cases is neither here nor there. We have no evidence of the potential consequences of a decision one way or the other in this case. So it's difficult to say what weight should be given to that particular argument. So far as mediation is concerned, it was tried both before the county court hearing and before this hearing. At least it was considered by the parties, but sadly we are here this time. Did you say there's no different approach of rectification to a trust deed? My lord, the passage from Lewin suggests that there is a difference of approach. FSHC is not... What are your submissions about that? Well, 
Well, my Lord, my submission must be caveated by the point that I simply haven't had the opportunity to look fully at what Lewin on Trust says and the authorities it cites. But if what is said at paragraph 5079 is correct, then it, the, the test appears to be very similar to that in SHC. Does the well, petition post date SHC? I, I, I believe it does. That's a point that we checked. My, I, I'm, my, what I'm told this was the 1st of March 2020. Well, obviously, I'd like to see the ideally to see the book itself to see if FSHC is mentioned at all. Um, so it does post date, um, Lewin post dates FSHC. Oh, we believe it does. Yes. Well, I'm sure we can find it pretty quickly. Um, but if the passage at 5079 reflects the correct test, in my suspicion that test is also passed, essentially for the reasons I submitted. Right. Okay. Hold on, unless there's anything else. Thank you very much, Mr. Yes. Well, my lords, um, in relation to the question which may now have passed as to who signs the TR1, um, I can hand up if it assists the case of Taylor and Taylor, which is 2017 EWHC 1080, uh, which is a decision of Judge Paul Matthews sitting as a judge of the High Court. Um, he found that the TR1 was effective as regards his declaration, even if not signed by the transferee. And the basis of the argument, if I've correctly understood it, is because, of course, it's the trans, the property is vested in the transferors at the date of the declaration. So that passes the Section 53 point. Um, well, it doesn't pass Section 53 because. Uh, um, the effect of the TR1 is to transfer the legal property to the trustees. I, I, if I had done justice to the judge's argument, as I understand it, and perhaps if your lordship, would you wish to see the case? Yes, all? absolutely. Um, perhaps we can pass up. The argument that transfer all is the settle all, who is settling it on the transferees as trustees, yes. and that in those circumstances, section 53 is complied with by the signature of the settle all. Yes, but there is another there is another argument I think that also comes out of it, which is that um, the transferee's interest is beneficial, not legal, at the juncture of the TR1. So again, I don't think it requires a written instrument. What? That's what section 53.1b says, that it requires a written instrument. Section well, 51.3c says that equitable interests do too. I think it's not going to assist your lordships or me to conduct the argument without the benefit of the authority. Um, Are you going to hand those up then? Well, I, I hope so. We only need one copy anyway because we've got it online. Um, the head note obviously addresses it under hell and paragraph 42 my lords is on the judge Matthews sets out 
basis on which the summary is contained in the head. So he says even if he's wrong, there was a severance and so on. Yes, I, of course he does. But that is per imperial. I mean, the. I mean, it's quite extraordinary that there's no treatment of conveyance in practice in the notes, which say hey, it's got to be signed by the transferee because it's because of section 53.1b. Well, <laughs> there's no cross appeal. I, I address to you, your lordships, because the point was raised. Um, the judge accepted the analysis in Taylor and Taylor, mm. and there it is for the purposes of this case. But I contend it's correct in any event. Um. Mm -hmm. I see further complications. If the declaration of trust is being made by the transferor, why are we concerned with the state of mind of the transferees at all for the purposes of rectification? It's a good question, but, but, but one is the, the, the one I, I'm blissfully, I, I don't have to answer in no, to well succeed, and, and, yeah. and I, I recognize that. Um, but um, it seems to me, if I could go on to, I'm handing up now um, the cases which your lordship, or one of them, which is Butlin Settlement Trust. I mean, if, if my lord's right, if this is right, um, the, um, then the state of mind of the of the gratuitous, effectively gratuitous beneficiaries. This is this is taken from the law about declaring set laws. Yes. Set lord, I I settle my estate on you um, for the benefit of your you and your children to hold in trust for you and your children. Uh, of course, um, then the rectification would depend on the state of mind of the set law, because it's a gift. But Matthews rejects that out of hand and says, well, it doesn't matter that it's for value. But it does matter that it's for value, because then, then if, if he were right, rectification would only be at looking at the state of mind of the set law. And, and you know, that's what this case says. That's what this case says, Butlins. Sorry. Oh, uh, so you haven't given me Butlins, you've given me Univar, so give me. But that's what Butlins says. I'm, I'm grateful. Well, can I, um, I, I know your lordships are all too familiar with these cases. Can I pick up on... We're looking at Univar, are we? Well, you've got that as well. And, and the reason you've got, uh, no, you've got AMP, UK and Barker, I think behind um, and Univar, 
is a case I haven't even had an opportunity to consider because I'm told that it refers to FSHC. I mean, just for the sake of completeness, I've only got Univar. Ah. But I can get it all online anyway. Which, which do you want us to look at? Well, could we start with Rebuttal and Settlement Trust? Right. Uh, simply because... That's the one I can't easily get online, but I can, I can I suppose. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've got it. So, um, I turn, and this is difficult in terms of the pagination because it is rather discreet, but at page nine. judgment of Mr. Justice Brightman. Um, he obviously sets out there the third paragraph down um, about where the line is to be drawn. It seems to me that the solution to the problem lies in the fact that rectification is a discretionary remedy. In other words, in the absence of an actual bargain between the settler and the trustee, one, a settler may seek rectification by proving the settlement does not express his true intention, or the true intention of himself and any party with whom he has bargained, the spouse in the case of an anti-nuptial uh, settlement. It is not essential for him to prove the settlement fails to express the two intentions of the trustees if they have not bargained, but the court may in its discretion decline to rectify. Now, the point that I obviously make here is that in relation to this transfer, it is the product of a bargain because the son commits under the transfer deed to pay the money but in a more general view of the transaction, commits to the mortgage. So that's the first distinction I say that, that you've got there. So if I can draw the case with a pension, what the, the situation in regard to the pension is not analogous to this situation in that there is a bargain by the parties to the trust instrument either when you look at it on its actual terms or when you look at it in its wider context. Yeah. The next point I take you to is if I can move on to AMP UK and Barker, which was a decision of uh, Mr. Justice Lawrence Collins, as he was. Um, and there, um, if I take you to paragraph 64, I invite your lordship to read from 64 to 67. Sorry, you've just got to let me get it first. I'm, I'm so sorry, my lord. It's on the back of this one. Oh, it's on the back. The back of the small one. Uh, yes, OK, thank you. Which page? Which paragraph? Uh, it's page 15, paragraph 64, my lord. Yeah. The point that I derive, derive here is, so, so if one looks at intention, firstly if I can pick up um, from the observations of my, Lord, of my Lord, Lord Justice Popple, you have to, whether you, even if you have a single trustee, he, she or it has to intend the outcome affected by the rectification. So the first point we take is, well, the fact that you haven't considered something or the fact that you don't intend something doesn't, isn't the same as an actual intention for the term achieved by rectification. 
So when one compares that with the trial judge's approach, and indeed Mr Justice Morris's approach, the test they applied was, well, because there was no agreement on box 11, box 11 can go out. Whereas in fact the finding would have to be is that there was an intention not to complete box 11. A non-intention is not to be mistaken for intention not. My Lord, yes. It's so much better than I exactly. If we then move forward, in the pension cases, where you have more than one trustee, or where you have more than one settler, they must both share that intention. It's not necessary, it would appear, for them to communicate that intention, but they must share it. Where do you get that from? Well, I'm reading that from, well, 66 to 67. But, well, the matter is that, in fact, your Lordship is right. The matter is not quite clear, because 67, it says, consequently, what... AMP has to show convincingly is a continuing common intention by the trustees and the MPI to affect any incapacity benefit. It's clear from the fact of finding there is overwhelming evidence that their intentions were limited to improving the benefits of those leaving on account of incapacity. And they have not the slightest intention to benefit early leavers in general. If objective manifestation of their intentions is a separate requirement, then there can be no doubt that it is fulfilled in abundance. This is paragraph 67. So I'm taking it through in stages. So I'm saying, so the next question is, do you need to have that, uh, that manifestation. In that regard, my lords, and I have had no opportunity to consider anything more than the head note, the Univar case, which is a decision of Mr Justice Trower, reading from the head note under rectification, Just pausing there, I note that at paragraph 78 of FSHC, Lord Justice Leggett, as he then was, endorses your interpretation of AMP as being uh, intentions enough, no need for any manifestation. Yes. Um, what I was going to go on, so if you take it on the stages, so why we say this appeal should succeed is even if this were a pure pension case, no intention can, non-intention cannot be equated to intention. However, because there's more than one trustee, they've both got to have had that same intention, even though they don't communicate it, and the findings of fact do not establish that at all. But the third point that I go forward on is I say, and you see this in... Um, a and P and Barker, and you see this in, in um, we battle in, is that um, you have to look at the question of bargain. Because in the case of a settlement, well, you're, it isn't a bargain. You're the recipient. You're, you're not, you, you, you haven't negotiated for this in the legal context. And so we say FSHC does apply because if you draw, for instance, a distinction between re, in re, battle, in re uh, battling, the trustee who was objecting, as I, as I recall the fact, was not a beneficiary, for instance. And they, that was one of the points that was highlighted. But the fourth point, my lords, which I say is not addressed on any of these cases, but most definitely makes it a higher standard is the fact that the consequence of the transfer is that the appellant holds half the beneficial interest. So if you compare that with the pension trustees case, you're not talking about my rights are under a pension, under the rules. If the rules say I can change the rules, then my rights have not been affected, because all I had was a right to the rules which might be changed. In this instance, 
I have acquired a beneficial interest. And so it would be strange indeed if the higher test were not appropriate in order to deprive me of that. Because what equity is doing on the rectification is taking away from me a property right I otherwise had. And that has to be vested on the unconscionability that would arise from a finding that son knew that father intended there to be no declaration of trust and that he also intended there to be no declaration of trust. That is the essence of FSHC. Now in the bargain case, of course, the parties, you are altering the party's contractual rights. But here you're going still further, you're, you're altering the party's proprietary rights. And because it's the exercise of an equitable relief, there has to be an equitable basis for it. And that, as identified in FSHC, comes out of the unconscionability of me enforcing the written instrument against what I knew to be the other party's intention and which intention I shared. Well, the fact that the consequence is an undoing of property rights isn't peculiar to this particular context. It's applied equally in a sale of goods context. Property rights that flow from a contract often have to be undone if the contract has to be undone. Oh, oh yes, it my lord. Doesn't matter whether one's talking in, in terms of real property or chattel. I suppose my my argument is is, is it's where you're the beneficiary under the settlement. If I can put it in the most vernacular, you, you should be pleased with what you're given. When you step beyond those transactions. And that's why in rebuffing they talk about bargain for, the nature of the bargain. It is a different situation. The written instrument has given you something of value. And the consequences of the court's intervention will be to deprive you of that. And not only and it's not just to deprive you of that to put you back into the positions that you once were, which is a mistake. It's to give you a new contract and new rights. That is a very drastic equitable remedy. And therefore, when one analyzes in what circumstances should you use it, it has to be because it engages the conscience of the court to that extent. Which is why Lord Justice Leggett, as he once was, says, well, what is the basis of it at a later stage in his judgment? Why, why does it arise? It arises out of the communication, my knowledge, that you intended it to have the effect that's now argued for on rectification, and my agreement with that. And that's why I say it's that test does apply. If you, if, if you analyze this all through, this, this transaction that occurred does involve a bargain. It does involve the passing of real value, whether you call it property rights or you call it sale of goods. And in what circumstances is the court able to unpick it? Because really, FSH was as much about why the law is in the way it is as to what the law is. When one reads the judgment of Justice Leggett, he, he goes through the historical development of the law of rectification. And not only concludes by saying that is where the law now sits, but also says with jurisprudentially that is the reason why it sits in that way. Because that is the unconscionability. Can you help me as to the application of unconscionability? But um, if a court comes to the conclusion that, as you say, it would be unconscionable that you were deprived of an interest, but still more unconscionable that you kept it, where does that leave the court? Uh, granting the appeal, my lord, I submit it's not, it's not a balancing act. It's um, the, the question is whether the quality of unconscionability justifies the relief. Yes, but wouldn't, if, if, if a judge thought that it would be quite unconscionable for you to be deprived of something, but incredibly unconscionable for you to keep it, uh, does that not bear upon the court's conscience? 
and deciding whether to grant a, a remedy or not? It would, it, would, it would impact on the exercise of the discretion. Oh, that's but, what I mean. but it wouldn't impact on the test. That is how I read. Um, it, I, I think the best way, um, and I'm, I'm sure you're tired of hearing the, those initials, FSHC, and, and, and all too familiar with the judgment, but um, it is, in fact, perhaps the best point is it's, it's made in the New South Wales case, because, which is uh, uh, cited and applied in FSHC, because it is this question. It's um, the Court of Appeal of New South Wales, and it's tab 8 in the authority. And it's a paragraph 315, my lord. Now, there's a similar conclusion arrived at by uh, um, Lord Justice Legge. It's just this is more to hand. And it's paragraph 315 that the rationale for granting which, recommendation which report, is to report, avoid. Which report are you in now? I'm so sorry, my lord. It's, it's uh, the New South Wales report. In New South Wales, paragraph. Paragraph 315, my lord. Thank you. And it's looking for the rationale. The rationale for granting rectification is to avoid unconsciousness, un, un, unconscientious departure from the common intention, assists in deciding what is required for there to be common intention. If two negotiating parties each had a particular intention about the agreement, they would enter, and their intentions were identical, but that intention was disclosed by neither of them, and they later enter into a document that did not accord with that intention. What would be the injustice or unconscientiousness in either of them enforcing the document according to its terms? It's, it's that that you're looking at. And then when one goes to um, FSHC, um, a similar point is, is, so FSHC at tab 15, page 146, where a similar point is made. one wants the reference again at paragraph 73 a similar point is uh, 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 the point is, is put in another way in the context of the test. So my lord um, I think that perhaps the, the further way to answer your very proper question was to say this um, the appellants aren't actually asking the court for equitable assistance the appellants are seeking to enforce the terms of the written document So the balance of unconscionability might well come into play on the exercise of discretion. But in this case, that would be the point to be considered under our ground four. And it's a point, as it were, that would be for the respondents to overcome. So, my lords, um, We, for our side, really end where we started, which is saying this is a case where the test in FH, FSHC is determinative, and it wasn't satisfied. Um, my uh, learned junior has asked me to raise a point um, in response to my Lord Lord Jackson, because um, he did conduct the trial, and so he's anxious to show that he did um, a page uh, in terms of the case being fought as it were as an all or nothing case um, I've already indicated and I'm told not forcefully enough that, that from our side there was a, a desire to, to mediate but at page 65 you will see in the opening that uh, my learned junior did make clear for instance that the relief that being sought would acknowledge the £40,000 that had then been paid on the mortgage so we were not seeking 
to that extent an all or nothing position. But he's anxious at least to show that as a, as a practitioner of what might be called quasi-family cases, that he didn't take a utterly binary approach. We're looking here at the transcript. No, this is a supplemental bundle, my yes, lord, I'm sorry. Oh, you said page 65? I did, my lord, and I should have said it's that time of the afternoon. Page 65 of the supplemental bundle, uh, which is a slim, the slimmer one, if those working from the physical copies. Yes. Well, I've got page 65, electronic 66. And do it appears you have... to be a transcript of the hearing. Yes, and at 65 should be Mr. Woodhead. Yes, the second, second point. point. fallback position. Yes. But as I think is indicated there, and in fact is indicated in at least one of the cases we've looked at, it would have been open to the judge to have granted that remedy by way of an account. So it would have been open to the judge to, to credit the father with the capital payment. So insofar as it was necessary to view the balance of injustice, which I think is the better way to, to put it, the outcome being sought would have credited father with all the capital payments. He would have had the benefit of the property for the full 20 years in which he was in occupation. And that would be set off against the fact that the son, on the result that the judge arrived at, as a joint and several liability for a mortgage that severely affects his life going forward in his family, but no entitlement to the property whatsoever. I just don't understand how they can, except by consent, how the declaration and order for sale that you um, sought can um, give credit for the mortgage. Oh, for the capital payments, my lord, it, it most certainly can, under capital accounting. You, you would have, so there would be, um, you obviously have the argument with regard to occupation. That would probably be displaced by the argument that the property was intended for father and the family, and there's been no ousting of the son. There'd be no occupation then paid. And repayment of capital on a mortgage, as I recall actual accounting, is always credited. Right. Well, it's not before us, then. It, it's not, my lord. But, it, but if this case, what, what I'm submitting is, if this case had proceeded, on, and there would have been an order for sale, and there would have been the taking of an account. And similarly, my lord, Lord Jackson, if I can address further with regard to the equity of the situation, it would have been open to the court under Section 15, I think, of Talata, to exercise, would you call it a statutory discretion, with regard to the sale. So there were levers to be pulled to achieve greater or, or to reduce the injustice, as it were, in a situation where that seems to be visited on both parties in one sense. So the position that that um, we reach is that FSCH applies to um, a declaration of trust by a single, by a, two trustees with potentially competing interests, but not to a declaration of trust by two trustees with the same interest. Is that right? Um. I, I, you mean it, I think if you have a single trustee, there's a difference. I think if there's two trustees, they well, if it's a single trustee or a declaration of trust by trustees in the normal sense, um, obviously re Butlins and the pension trustee cases apply. Yes. Right. So you don't need anything to cross the line because there's no line to cross, except an actual intention. It, it is still that requirement that you intended the term you seek to rectify for. Yes. So Rather you, than so the, you may say it doesn't matter because here it's a case where there was no 
common intention, continuing common intention, let alone whether there was an outward expression of cause? There was no discussion, no intention, no thought on the point. That's the reality, and that's what the judge found. It's not what the judge held, but it's what he found. Well, yes. It's bit, on the bit, other hand, it's fatal to you if he was wrong on 76.1. Would it be fatal to me? It would on that analysis. If, 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 if the proper interpretation was what I was putting to you earlier, which my Lord or Justice Peter Jackson certainly may not share, nor may the Master of the Rolls, but if that were the right interpretation, then all you're left with is no outward expression of accord on the common intention that a father should have the sole beneficial interest. So it would matter in those circumstances. Yes. But then I, I would, if you'll forgive me, remind you, despite the hour, of quite what father's actual evidence as recorded in the judgment was. It, it, it's one thing to say, for a judge to say, well, you plainly didn't intend that because you didn't understand it. But I think it's a different thing to say where the, where the witness has said, my intention was that this property, the effect of the transaction would be that the property was held on trust for my children. Yes. I mean, I, speaking for myself, I can quite see the risk of, of imprecision uh, between, on the one hand, beneficial interests recognised by the law being vested in families, uh, which would be perhaps a surprising conclusion that there were to be beneficial interests of all the members of the family, and beneficial interests in the rather looser but real life sense that they were the people who were going to benefit because uh, it was in his name, but it was intended that they would enjoy it uh, and in due course might, uh, in whatever form was chosen, uh, receive further benefits by way of... And once one sees... I, I, I readily accept there is ambiguity or the potential for two different interpretations, and then I remind myself we must recall of the requirement for convincing proof. It's not. If you go down, if you go down the route of saying a non-intention is to be to be uh, equated with uh, 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 no intent or no intention between non-intention, whichever way you, you put it, then effectively you you are inviting tribunals to simply in cases where the whole point is silent. No, I understand that. I, we, we were we were on a slightly different point about the, the father's evidence about it being intended to be. A, in trust for the family, which you say ma makes it impossible to read the judge's judgment as one in which he was yes, sure that there was an intention he sh that there should be no beneficiary. I, yes, I, I think that, but it also should be had regard to that evidence was given in the context of a case where these two parties would have had to consider this question in the context of the litigation they were fighting. So I can readily understand that a comment made off the cuff during the course of a, you know, a, 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 even in front of a solicitor might have it. These parties came to a trial where one must assume they had had their lawyers attempt to explain to them the issues that were in the case, and they gave evidence against that background. Um, and and the evidence is, um, well we say it simply doesn't satisfy the test. It, it is um, capable of interpretation in a whole host of ways, which reminds you of the speech of, of Lady Hale in, in Stackendown as to what people understand and don't understand. But my point is, is that you've got to intend the contract as it is rectified. And I also am reminded of the point made by my learned friend, which was that the outcome achieved by the judge, that Sun had no interest, was only achieved by the subsequent application, and in fact by Mr. Justice Morris, of, well, I'm going to rebut the presumption that follows from uh, uh, equity following the law. So the whole thing is, is utterly confused. There isn't an intention on behalf of, e of either party, a clear intention, to say what they intended. And thus to uphold the appeal is simply to say, well, if they haven't discussed it, 
just can ignore it in reality. Um, and um, I would also remind the court, and I'm sure I don't, and they just as bad as intended, is that um, in a sense, one appellate court has already examined the findings of the trial judge. So when you had those two options, Mr. Justice Morris looked at it and said, well, it really can't be 2-1, can it? it? It can't be option. In other words, because you just can't read it in that way. So even the judge we were appealing against couldn't see within the findings of fact the, the basis of, of holding what was the respondent's primary case, which was, well, there was an agreement that had to be sold beneficial only. So I, 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 in, in so far as this court now comes to try and look at those facts, I do say, well, one appellate court's already looked at them and said, well, this doesn't work. My lords, unless there's any further points on which I can assist you. Thank you. Well, thank you both. We'll take time to consider uh, judgments in this case. We'll hand them down in the usual way. And when we do, we'd be grateful if you would uh, uh, let us have typographical corrections and agree the consequences of our decision um, as to costs and the order the court makes. Any argument will be in writing.